I want to talk this afternoon about something that's really serious and very deeply moving and stirring in my heart. I'm an engineer by training. I worked over 20 years for one of the largest engineering companies in the nation. I was 40 years of age, and I couldn't continue in that venue. I was bivocational, pastor in the inner city church in Charleston, West Virginia, and trying to work as an engineer, and they would send me all over the country. And I came home from work one day and told my wife, I can't do this anymore. I'm called to preach. And if I'm called to preach, I've got to give the best of my day every day and give myself to the people. And so I left that company. I was 40. I had five, I had five children. The oldest was 16 and the youngest was six. And uh, that was uh, 10 years ago. And uh, we've not missed a meal. God has been faithful. God has provided. And God has opened tremendous doors for our ministry in Charleston, West Virginia. I pastor in a little small city, but it has the highest, one of the highest uh, violent crime rates in the nation. Uh, a couple of years ago, I, I attended 14 funerals of young people that were murdered within a six-block radius of my church. Uh, I actually officiated seven of those funerals. I was just in a funeral before I got here last week of a young man that was killed in an automobile where he and another young man were driving under the influence of drugs. Both of them had been in programs that we run out of our church and our nonprofit organization, Hope Community Development Corporation. Over the past 15 years, I've tried to analyze as best I could what is happening to young people and how is the church responding uh, to what's happening to young people. And so I want to talk about this crisis in America, this broken juvenile justice system and the broken spirited youth that it oversees. This generation of young people have spirits that are deeply, deeply broken. And we got a major crisis on our hands, and a crisis will manifest itself in a pathology. And the pathology in our nation is the prison industrial complex. 2.2 million people incarcerated in this country. We release 700,000 every year to bring in 700,000 more into the prison industrial complex. Over 130 juveniles are incarcerated every day. And that's not the same group. They're moving in and out of detention and out of juvenile incarceration. There are over 7.3 million children who have an incarcerated parent or parents. According to the Justice Department, the number one indicator that a child will go to penitentiary is one of both parents being incarcerated, and 70% of all children with an incarcerated parent will be incarcerated themselves. That equates to 5.1 million children that will be incarcerated if we don't do something uh, to intervene. Now take a look at our pilot cities, and this is, this is quite interesting. I gather some data, and what you find is in our pilot cities, in the states where those cities are are located, there are 402,000 youth that appear in the court system every year in those, in those nine, nine states. 34,000 from the nine pilot cities. 34,000 youth from those nine pilot cities appear in the court system uh, in this country uh, every single year. There's over a million youth that appear in the court system in our country in any given year in this country. That is two-thirds the size of the United States military, and it happens every single year. And the church, for the most part, is totally oblivious to what's taking place, and I'm going to share with you why that's the case. When you look at those youth that are appearing within the court system or in our nine pilot states, what you find is that those kids had 420 homicides, 2,500 sexual assaults, 2,700 robberies, 3,300 aggravated assaults, and 1,100 simple assaults. That's 16,000 crimes that were committed against people, personal crimes, by the juveniles that's processed through our juvenile justice system. We got a serious problem on our hand. Now, what is causing this? And what, what is the consequence? What's the consequence? Well, the consequence is what we end up with is what Dr. Eugene Rivers refers to as these super predators of abused and neglected children grown into the largest group of remorseless, consciousness street criminals and gang members this country has ever seen. But it's not limited to the inner cities of our nation. Paducah, Columbine, Jonesboro, Peril, yeah. Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Those are not urban complexes. But these are young people who are hurting, who are aching, whose spirits have been broken, who have not been nurtured, who have not been embraced, evangelized, and discipled by the church. The most dangerous society that you can live in is a society that is free and where the children are out of control. 
by very the definition of being a free democratic republic, the children have to be under subjection. They have to buy into a discipline, a transcendent moral value system that causes them to police themselves. Otherwise, you have chaos when the children throw off moral restraints, disregard the law, and become a major part of the criminal element. And that's not where we're headed. That is where we are in the United States of America today. We're there already. And it's manifesting itself in the pathologies in our cities, in our communities, in our rural places. And what really is the cause? Because it's very important that we understand really what is taking place. And we're going to move beyond the shallow spiritual thinking and do some serious investigative work. Because we've got to understand really how did we get to where we currently are. I submit to you that the greatest neglect of the evangelical church over the last 50 years has been its neglect in the evangelization and discipleship of children. Name me the organization that has as their mission statement their goal to evangelize children. And the manifestation of the crime and the violence, the proliferation of our prison industrial complex growth, it is nothing more than the result of unevangelized children who grow up unnurtured, undisciplined, unconnected, and become a part of the criminal element. But where does it really start? Well, it starts with the breakdown of the nuclear and the extended family in an unprecedented way in the history of this great republic. In the African American community in this country, 70% of all African American children are born out of wedlock. Before you are too quick to judge, in 1960, Less than 50 years ago, 80% of all black children were born in two family households. This is a recent phenomenon over the last 45 years. In my state, 77% of all children are born out of wedlock. In my black children and in my city, it's 80%. But the Caucasian community is moving in the same direction. Six years ago, 29% of all Caucasian children were born out of wedlock. Now it's 35%. Six percentage points increase, and because Caucasians make up such a large uh, part of our population, that 35 percent is significant. About 50 percent of all Latino and Hispanic children are born out of wedlock. We're headed down a slippery slope to chaos, confusion, and anarchy. And let me tell you why. Because the family is the basic building block of society. We understand that. It is the foundation upon which everything else is built. But not only is it the foundation, it's a hook on which everything else is hung, and it's a lever by which you move things and you, you can lift things. When there's no family structure in place where there is a father to impose some discipline and to embrace and to espouse a worldview for that family, then you don't have the institution to pass on discipline. And that is the problem in our communities today. Children are not disciplined. So if they're not disciplined, then it's difficult for them to be educated because to be educated takes discipline. It takes focus. It takes concentration. If there's no one in the house to make sure that the television goes off at a reasonable hour so the children can get enough sleep, so they're not sleep deprived the next day in school, then the children will stay up all night because TV is on all night. When I was a child, and I'm a young man, unlike Dr. Knuckles and Dr. Dr. Paul C. I'm a young man. <laughs> but when I was a kid, at 11 o'clock, they played the Star Spangled Banner. And after they played the Star Spangled Banner, they said, this will, this will be all of our broadcasting for the day. And we operate on a certain frequency, and we will see you in the morning. Now, you could look at that screen all night if you wanted to. But nothing was coming on until in the morning. <laughs> Now in our society, you have satellite television, you have cable TV, it's 24-7. And now in our society, you have the possibility for the most vile person in the culture, basically to have access to your children in their bedroom via the technology. The breakdown of the family. The breakdown of the community, because the extended family is broken down. The ineffectiveness of the church to evangelize these children. And we have not been effective. And one of the reasons we haven't been effective is because we do not know how to do ministry in a hostile environment. This country was established by the founding fathers 
who even though they said they were not going to establish a religion or so preferential treatment to one, we did. And so Christianity had a field day in the early uh, years of this country. And unlike it is today, what Dr. Gordon England said this morning, uh, anything but Christian, before it was anything Christian. Until about 1962, with the Supreme Court citizens that removed prayer from public school. And we've gradually moved toward a more hostile uh, feeling toward the Christian faith. So we don't know how to do ministry in a hostile environment. So we're complaining about the fact it's difficult and it's hard for us because society no, society no longer accommodates our evangelistic efforts. And so we're still trapped in historical time warp. And we've got to learn how to do it. We've got to learn how to do it. So we see the cause and we, we see the crisis. And let's move beyond in the last few, last few moments and talk about what really is the cure. That's what we want to talk about. What really is, is the cure? Well, the cure is for the church to really be the church, to establish evangelism as a priority, evangelism of children as a priority of the church. And how do we evangelize children in a culture that has a philosophy that says anything but Christian? Well, I'm glad you asked the question. Because what we've got to do is we've got to understand the Great Commission, which we have slightly misunderstood. We understand that geographically we're to go around the world and establish mission outposts and win people to Christ. What we don't understand about the Great Commission is that the way Jesus modeled the commission is that he went into his world system. He went into the political system, the marketplace, the fish market, the farming villages, the shepherds. He went into the political system dealing with the Pharisees and the chief priests and the scribes, the religious system, the same cast of characters. He went into the system where the people were, and he won people in the system. The Great Commission requires us to go in the systems that trap people. We all live in a system, a family system, a community system, an economic system, an employment system. There are systems that have influence on our lives. Our children are trapped in systems. They're trapped in a failing school system. They're trapped in the juvenile justice system. They're trapped in the detention centers. And so what we have to do is develop a strategy of evangelism to where we go into these systems. We mobilize all the troops, counsel all furloughs, all soldiers report for duty. And we're going to go into the public school system doing mentoring, school-based mentoring. Uh, Dr. Harold Davis has a content-based curriculum, Talks My Father and Talks My Mother Never Had With Me, to mobilize Christians to go in the school system, build relationships which transfer outside of school to both children and parents to share the gospel. We get the elite forces and the special guard of folk who really got passion to go into detention centers and incarceration systems, and we win young people to Christ by building relationships across which the gospel can be shared. So here is the challenge. The challenge are, is, are we going to respond to this? Are we going to respond to go where the real battle is being waged? And the battle for the hearts, the souls, the minds, and the spirits of this generation, it has been waged in these systems, in the public school system, in the juvenile incarceration system, the juvenile court system. It has been waged on the streets and in the public housing complexes. That's the challenge. We can do this. We're more than capable of doing it because greater is the one that's in us than he that is in, that he's in the world. Now, let me tell you how you start. We start where we can have some victory. We have children and we have grandchildren in the public school. We have every right to be there and we ought to be there. We need to organize our effort. And we're going in and we're going to establish mentoring programs in the school that's near our churches and near where our members work. And we're going to mobilize them to go in as a mighty army. We're going in going, doing good deeds. And we're working with children that other people don't want to work with. And we'll win some of those kids to Christ, and they become a part of our army. And then we develop a strategy to deal with these other more complex systems, like the court system and so forth. Well, I'll close with this. When I was a kid growing up, my mother and my grandfather, or my stepfather, my mother and my stepfather, took a third of their life savings of $10,000 and they bought me a car. They said, you've been a good boy and you never asked for anything. So I graduated from high school and they bought me a car, 1972 Duster, and my mother called it the chariot. I made them take their shoes off to get in it. I love the chariot and I like to tinker on it 
And one day I was working on my car, and my father, whom I didn't stay with, but he, he and I became great friends. And my father came, he saw me tink on my car, and he said, son, do you want to work on that car, or do you want to fix it? And I said, Dad, I want to fix the car. He said, well, son, if you want to work on it, then you got job security. If you want to fix it, you got to do something different. He said, if you want to fix it, take those crazy tools of yours, because you never invest in tools, and that's half the job, and put them in the trunk, and go get my toolbox out of the truck, and bring it to me, and then stand beside me and watch. He said, now, if I can't fix it, son, then call the tow truck, because it can't be fixed. He prided himself on being a master mechanic, and that he was. I miss my father. I didn't spend enough time with him. I didn't learn all his mechanical genius. Had I spent time with him, then now I wouldn't have to take my car into the shop every time it breaks or something's going to break. And they raise the hood, and he says, it's going to cost you $100. And I say, Dad, where are you? But we have a heavenly father, and we can call him. And if we really want to fix this problem, then our heavenly father will hear our cry, and he will come. And he can do what my earthly father couldn't do and can't do. He gets inside of us in the person of the Holy Spirit. And he takes his mind, which my father couldn't take his mind and put it in my mind, nor he could, nor could he take his dexterity and put it in my hands. But our Heavenly Father can. And he can help us fix this problem. As I close, I used to love the $6 million man, Lee Majors. That was my man. Tragic accident. And the ominous voice said, it's pretty bad. But he says, you know, we can rebuild him. We have the technology. We have the know-how. We can make him faster and stronger and better. We can reach our children. We have the know-how. We have the technology. We can make them spiritually better. We can make them intellectually faster. And we can make them morally stronger if we're willing to engage in this great conflict of winning this generation of children to Christ. I appreciate your attentiveness and I thank you for the opportunity.